Hi everybody and welcome to the channel. Today I wanted to talk a little bit about kidnapping. I know it's an unpleasant subject, but given the state that we are in in America and the massive amount of unemployment and jobless claims, and I do have some statistics to pull up, I don't know that we really need them. It is, uh, you know, pretty astronomical what's going on right now. It says that the Department of Labor announced that there was an increase in the number of first time unemployment claims the week of March 13th, 2021. According to the Department of Labor news release on March 18, 2021, the number of initial claims reached 770,000, an increase of 45,000 from the previous week's claims. Okay, so that's from the Department of Labor. Well, I'm bringing this up because one of the societal effects there are many there are many but one of the societal effects and i can speak from experience i know i talk about that a lot are what are the social consequences of unemployment on society and in one of the articles that i pulled up of course you're going to have a, a high in, in poverty a loss of human resources and mental illness, all different types of personal problems, basically from lack of income. I'm trying to see if I can find uh, the exact article. I just had it. I have a lot of different tabs open right now. And I just did the societal effects. This one may have it. Okay, here it is. Okay, this is just kind of a generalized article about what are the side effects or the effects of unemployment on society. This article was done in uh, Mar on March 25th, 2020, which was right after, two or three days after, you know, I, I wanna be careful what I say, but I, I think most of us know what was declared on, I believe it was March 23rd of last year. It says that unemployment causes widespread poverty, increased crime rates, political instability, exploitation of labor, and reduced economic development in the society. It also may lead to psychological problems such as mental illness, anxiety, and depression. Okay, well, we have all of this going on right now. And it is sad, and but it's scary. But looking at it objectively, I think it's important to glean that we know that these things are going on and I, I am more of a, probably of, a, of an empath type of person. So I really feel the emotional components of what are, you know, what's going on. However, I'm really working to try to remove myself from that to the best of my degree, because I want you to see about how important it is for you to protect yourself, no matter what condition you're in. You don't have to be ill. You know, you you can be healthy and well. It uh, it just doesn't really discriminate. <laughs> to a degree, it doesn't. But we do. We have the political instability, the widespread poverty. It says unemployed people have no source of income, which makes them unable to access basic amenities like quality health care, education, and nutrition. So they're compelled to live in poor conditions. 
I believe we are well on our way to that. I know it is already happening in some states. It also causes a reduction in spending power of the economy. Okay, we're there. And this may have a ripple effect that causes further job, loss of jobs. So in that regard, an economic recession may occur due to unsustainable employment rates. Uh, exploitation of labor. Uh, it says that unemployment in a society may lead to a surplus of labor in the economy. In this regard, employees readily accept to work for low wages and harsh environmental conditions. This sense of desperation by employees exposes them to mistreatment and exploitation by their employers. Well, I think we can say that that is going on. There are certain mandates that are occurring that people are, are basically consenting to because they have to put food on the table. And I really believe that that aspect of what's going on, and I'm trying to be careful in what I'm saying, but by people who are being faced with either taking something or not, are being exploited. This is uh, something that is readily seen in third world countries, and that's where skilled laborers earn less than $2 per day, despite their experience and educational qualifications. So I want to go on down to psychological problems. Okay, that's kind of the root. That's the uh, unstable foundation for criminal activity. Loss of employment may reduce in mental illness, may result, I'm sorry, in mental illness, depression, loss of self-esteem, and increased anxiety because no one can afford to support or provide for their families. Extreme cases of psychological problems arising from unemployment may lead to suicide, domestic violence, or divorce. And you've got wasted skills. And then we have right here, this little gem right here called increased crime rates. It says that idle youth are forced into criminal activities such as armed robberies, drug trafficking, gambling, prostitution. That's to put it mildly. That's putting it mildly, and that's putting it optimistically. It says such crimes are common in inner cities and less developed nations due to inadequate employment opportunities, but we're currently in a position right now where there is some there are subsidies for people that are appealing to people to not work however that is not going to diminish crime that is not the answer to reducing the crime rate is to subsidize people for not working it's really on the contrary it also says that unemployed youth often join illegal gangs and terrorist organizations in a bid to earn some income. Well, you know, this is going on like over in Somalia, but it also says that that is what that was widely fueled by unemployment due to decades of political instability. Well, we're seeing that. I would say we're in the birth pains. Uh, possibly, we're, well, not possibly, we're in the birth pains of that right now. But I'm emphasizing the crime rate because they're typically kidnappings are occur during this type of climate. Kidnappings, carjackings. Armed robberies, homicides, that type of thing. But I'm focusing on kidnappings. And I wanted to show you there's this case. And it's about a man named Gary Brown who murdered a beautiful young woman. She, this is her family here. This is her right here, Kathy. 
she was a really beautiful young woman, Kathy O'Daniel. I'm going to read you. This happened in Tombaugh, Texas. And then I'm going to play a little bit of video. And I'm going to let the killer tell you how he selected her and where she was located. And I'm going to go ahead and attempt to play just a little bit at a time. This is a victim offender mediation. I did mention in a video, and I did put this down as a link I wanted you to go to, because I want you to understand how and why it is so important to protect yourself from the heartstrings, from rendering aid to people, men, boys, young people, and going to gas stations late at night, ladies, and men both. Why it is important for you to not be out at night, no matter what. I, I know some people have to go to work. However, stopping at a gas station, and this is not this individual's fault, but as preventative measure, I'm just stressing whatever you do, if you go to a gas station at night, ladies, do not offer to assist anyone for anything. And and if you can, carry keep some gas cans filled with uh with fuel and properly store them so you don't have to do this. But this is the killer Gary Brown. I'm gonna show little snippets and then I'm gonna get into let him tell you how and why he selected this young woman. Let me see if I can just go ahead. This is the family. He's nervous about he's nervous about it. This is the daughter and the mother here. This is her anything daughter. that she said to him. I mean, anything that she said to anybody I want to hear. You know, any little piece of information I can get. Anything. And of course, I want to know some things that happened that day. That's been the one thing all these years that I've not been able to think about, those last few moments. I've never been able to think about that. When you had come the, the first time, you had said that he didn't know that Kathy had a daughter. And I want to know if that would have made any difference. Okay, so they're talking about, uh, said, they're talking about their upcoming victim offender mediation with Gary Brown, who was a juvenile when he committed this crime. He, along with another companion, another offender, were out under the influence looking to do this type of crime. So, I'm going to let some of this play out a little bit, and then I'm going to share a few things with you all. So I, I want to keep from getting a copyright. I, I hope I don't get one because I think everybody ought to see this. I think everybody needs to know that this is the climate that we're living in. I mean, it really, truly is. Part where she realized, you know, the gun was on her. She had no choice. Okay. This is no kind of tough. Like. The state of Texas took care of them for me. I didn't ever want to think about him again. And it probably would have been okay to stay that way if I hadn't gotten involved in restorative justice and started teaching in prison. And I couldn't let them, I couldn't just let them be the boys that killed my daughter. All of a sudden, I did want to think of them in human terms. To help cope with her grief, Linda went back to school and now teaches psychology and philosophy in two Huntsville prison units. Good evening. Good evening. Look at the definition of aggression that Myers gives. Yeah, behavior intended to hurt. Okay. Behavior intended to hurt. Everybody has that in them to a degree. You know, we all get angry. But this woman, Kathy's mother, changed her whole life, her whole life, trying to understand why this individual did this to her daughter, who she gave birth to, 
who she raised and bonded with and nurtured and cared for, loved as a mother. She completely changed her life and wanted to help teach these people, help them understand the cause and effect of such a crime. So I have to commend her for that. However, it is very tragic. However, it is very tragic, the circumstances which led her down this path. What to do today is to get him to look at that. So you don't remember everything because you were so high? As far as for things you can remember the most, mm -hmm. and, and for me, was that extra part where she realized, you know, their gun was on her. She had no choice from that point on. And what do you mean by she had no choice? Whatever we was, whatever we said, that's what she was going to do. And and what did you do? We led her down a road where there was leading out into pasture and country, to where you know we'd be away from everything. Where we choose participated in sex. And so, what you really did was, what did you do to this woman? You need to use those words. You raped her. You raped her. Both of you raped her. Yes, ma'am. I held a gun and my foul partner did his part in the what sex, did you do? raping her. And then it was done that he held the gun and I went back and I participated in the rape and did it too. Amy, on her own initiative, has written a letter back to Gary. Okay, so he's admitted it. He does look very remorseful. I have seen the entire video, and I did leave a link in one of my previous videos that he, you know, to this particular video. He does seem very remorseful. But I want to see if I can cue it up to where he, if he actually admits how. He lured this woman at the gas station and that's why I'm putting some of these videos up and then I have another one I want to show you we have Gary is that we never did have enough of what really happened to put things together that's Kathy's I'm hoping mother. that by going through this all over again not on my behalf but on y'all's behalf that y'all don't wind up hating me even more and never even been to consider anything about me being good in it changing which I've dealt with all these years I, I, I just feel like the sooner we can kind of get maybe we just need to get past that can you do it we'll okay so the mother Kathy's mother is just really intent on She's being very generous and very supportive, in my opinion, and that's her daughter, her young daughter. Oh, Scott, true. This part was volunteered. The, the, at that time, the gun was never pulled. There was nothing. She didn't even know we had it. It was when we got close to Alvin, that's where we wound up. Things wound up changing. I let her down, told her where to go down a road that I knew was leading to nothing out in pasture. And then when she asked why, Marvin pulled the gun. He had the gun on. He says, don't worry about it. Just do, do what we're telling you. Do you know why it, did, it went in the direction it went? I mean, can you remember back that? What happened? thought was shooting in the leg would give us time to get away. And honestly, at first, there was no intent. It, it did change up. But there was no intent of killing it was to slow her down so we'd be able to get in the car and get away and be long gone before she could tell anybody what had happened. In our minds, we felt we had no choice. Well, that's pretty sad. That's horrific. Like I said, the mother, this young girl's mother, I don't know why I can't get that to disappear. This young girl's mother was at a gas station. She felt sorry for these two. They said they were having vehicle problems and she was willing to drive them. She was a really good hearted woman and she was very young. 
she was pregnant and she had her whole life ahead of her but she felt sorry for him this guy and his and his buddy and agreed to to drive them somewhere you know about this she's already seen our faces <clears throat> i mean it wasn't like she was she pissed you off or she was like or y'all even had to force her to do it she she was just doing it just to be nice and those were like pretty much the last thing she said was just why when she was out there and we, she heard me and him talking and we had realized we'd already gone too far she said, you can take the car, you can take the money, you can take anything you want, and I won't say nothing. And then as Marvin put the point of the gun towards the way, she said, I forgive you, and God will too. It's an incredible woman. That is an incredible woman that would say that. Knowing she was pregnant, knowing she wouldn't live, but yet, probably clinging to that hope that she would. And I share that with you because I've been in very similar shoes. And you get to that point when you are at the mercy of another individual where that part of you has given up, but there's still that little bit that little bit left that just hopes that someone will spare you, that just spare your life. And then she put her head down. It's very difficult. She was too busy trying to keep up what was going on. We thought she might have told you to keep you from killing her. Honestly, I didn't know this until this is about her almost being a little bit after the conviction. And me getting convicted back then. There was a lot of things I didn't even know. I didn't know about you. I just wondered what she told you. Like if she said anything about her being pregnant or she said anything about me. Because I just wondered if that would have saved her. My opinion is why she didn't want to say too much. is because maybe she would have been scared. It could have raised an, uh, a reaction or more hostility towards her. You remember what she looked like? I remember she had, I want to say, blonde hair. That's, that's very telling. And that's really sad. He wants to say that she had that particular color hair. He doesn't really remember the victim. To him, way back then, she was just someone that they were out to rape and rob and humiliate and destroy. All because they were under the influence of drugs and alcohol. He goes on later to state that he was the victim of a, an abusive father, of a sexually abusive father. And I have heard that men turn it outward, women turn it inward, but I don't feel like it's an excuse for why he did what he did. And it goes to show you that you may think you can reason with somebody violent. You may think that you'll have the right thing to say, but the truth of the matter is there's no reasoning with these people. There's just really no reasoning with these people. Uh, I wanted to read the mother. This is the victim here. She was very excited about her life. It says, final conversations between murder victims and the family members. 
they leave behind have a way of becoming the subject of lifelong regret. Words not spoken or last moments wasted on the, tri on the trivial can harden into a lasting memory of love left unexpressed. John and Linda White were spared that burden. The middle of their three children, Kathy, had stumbled through adulthood. There was an unplanned pregnancy, a rushed marriage, divorce, and struggles with alcohol. But by age 26, she seemed to be riding her course. So she, she was getting her life in order. Things were finally coming together. And I'm, I'm, I want to let you know that when everything, when the stars really seem to align, you, you have to watch out for these really strange things coming out of nowhere. That was something that I could relate to. I was I was up in the process of getting my life together. There were a lot of things that were not going well for me, but I had gotten my life together. And that's kind of one of those common denominators that you have to watch out for the curveball. It's just one of those things in life. So she can, had confided to her mother that she was expecting her second child and intended to marry the father who was a doctor. Well, days later, and they're not going into the full story about the gas station, she suddenly disappeared. And it says, so this is something that really bothered me about the offender, and then I'm going to show you why. And I, I can't tell how far along I am into my video. It says that one of the many calls the family received during the four agonizing days that she was missing was from a 15-year-old named Gary Brown. And that was the offender that showed the video. He anonymously called to assure the family that Kathy was safe, but needed time alone to sort out some personal issues. That's a 15 year old. That's a 15 year old coming up with that. That's very cunning. Very cunning. Kathy was safe but needed time alone. I mean, that's like something you would get from an adult. The call was a cruel ploy, Brown's attempt to buy himself time. He and another 15-year-old named Marion Marvin Barry had already abducted Kathy, sexually assaulted her, and then shot her to death. I know they disfigured her face. The boys were arrested later with Kathy's car northeast of Dallas. It had been, they had been stealing and dragging their way around a large swath of Texas after escaping from a Houston rehab center. Okay, so these were boys that already had problems with drugs and alcohol. And we have, in America, we have such an alarming number of places like this for halfway houses. They're everywhere. I don't know if you've ever done any research, but there are halfway houses in nice neighborhoods now. And it doesn't qualify for much for you to turn your home into a halfway house. I recently found out there's several in my neighborhood and they're going up quickly. And there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, the number of offenders on the rise, the less space, less availability uh, for them to be incarcerated and serve their time. But I can probably, I don't want to say I can guarantee you. It depends on where you live. You may live in a rural area out in the country. You may live in a country that you don't have these issues, but in America, boy, do we ever have them. This is another interesting point I wanted to make. It said that these boys, they had few belongings. Found on Brown at his arrest were a rosary, a Bible, two packs of cigarettes, and no money. No money. They happened upon her at a gas station where they'd been marooned when their stolen car broke down. 
Brown led police to her body off of a remote dirt road. Okay, so for all of that criminal activity, he had a Bible and a rosary. He had cigarettes, but they didn't have any money. The mom said for three weeks she was numb. She said that uh, she was smoking as much as she could smoke. She was a nervous wreck. So, it says ultimately, because they were so young, both of them had taken plea deals. Well, the mother really had a change of heart. And needed more closure. So she basically decided after going back to school and earning a degree and working with inmates, she needed to be healed in a certain way. It says that as a grad student teacher, she took on a heavy load at Sam Houston at a local community college. One day while teaching at the community college, her students started talking about Susan Smith, the South Carolina woman, then in the news for drowning her two youngest sons. After, a, uh, while setting off a frantic search for a fictitious carjacker kidnapping, the students' reactions shocked White. They wanted to string her up, she says. Actually, they wanted to kill her the way she killed her boys. Well, the mom said that she looked at the expressions on their faces and decided that that was violence. That reaction was violence. Everything going on that day in that discussion in that classroom was violence. There was no one being struck, but there were violent thoughts and violent words. And I was just... And, and I just was incredibly uncomfortable with it. So that's a really, really compassionate woman. She says, why is it that everything about is about bringing people down, punishing and adding more suffering to the world? That's a question that will never be answered, by the way, in my opinion. So. She basically went down the restorative justice aisle. It was a movement that started in the 70s and 80s. And it's supposed to improve recidivism, recidivism rates by holding offenders directly accountable to their victims. I was offered a chance by HBO back in the day to, they were going to videotape and help arrange for me through the Texas Department for Victim Services, basically, victim, victim um, offender mediation to meet with my offender. And I was encouraged, really, I was encouraged not to do that. Thank God I had someone in my life that had their head on, had his head on screwed tightly. It was a doctor and he said, absolutely not. Don't do that. And I'm glad I didn't. And it says here that victims seem to appreciate the process. Okay. Well, in my opinion, this was the accomplice right here, Marianne Marvin Berry when he was 42 and more than 27 years into his sentence, and he, he didn't act right the whole time. Well, they met, and I did show you some of that. It's a long film. Although for them, I'm sure it just barely touches the surface. It says that the, that the offender, Brown, Gary Brown, makes no excuses during the encounter. Not about his catastrophic upbringing, not about being too high to know what they were doing, not to stress that it was Barry who pulled the trigger, and the whites get to make the points that they came to make about Kathy's life. But see, he, he didn't really care about Kathy's life. He couldn't even remember what she looked like. They did show him some photographs, and, you know, the mother just basically... 
wanted to support him being released on parole because she felt like the best, you know, retribution would be for him to lead a really good, happy, healthy, and normal life. There's a lot of spreading the gospel. It says here, the approach sounds simplistic, but to why such counseling with victims is necessary toward prisoners' re-entry into society. And often the first time prisoners have directly confronted the harm they have caused, the toughest thing they can imagine would be to sit across the table from a family member or their murder victim. It's just much more easier for them to sit there and do that, to sit and do their time in prison and not have any real connection with the victim. And I have felt that way. I have felt that way because I have found out through the grapevine that uh, my offender, his memory of what happened is inaccurate, to say the least. Even though he admitted to the crime, he admitted to it, but he just doesn't understand why I haven't, you know, basically, I guess he doesn't understand why I still go to the hearings that I go to. So here, here is after they've already had kind of this forgiveness reunion. I think she's been incredibly magnanimous and very generous. I, I feel like she's been almost and I'm, I'm going to make a point about this because it's just how I feel and I, I want to get it out. Well, well, you know, it's almost 4.30 and we're going to have to be finishing. Do y'all have any thoughts, any final things that you would like to say to Gary? Well, Amy and I have been whispering. What we've been whispering about is is uh, we'd like Gary to have a picture of us. And you I can get close. You don't have to stand back. The ending surprised me for a couple reasons. Yeah, it felt really good thinking, here are the two people supposed to be hating me. But they were still willing, you know, to embrace in a pitcher. I feel like I was here with a baseball bat, you know, knocked in left field, because, I mean, that really surprised me. Say cheese, Gary. Cheese. <laughs> for me, it was the most logical thing in the world. This is After this time together. <laughs> what we gave each other. <laughs> to have a hug at the end. You know, that's pretty powerful stuff. I just, I think in this case, his remorse is very clear and evident. But you know what? It's too little, too late. That person is gone. That person that Kathy's mother tended to and carried in her womb is gone and will never get her back. And I know to some degree she's trying to get her back by having this victim offender mediation. She's trying to get that part of herself back, the mom that she was, that role that, she, not just the role that she had, but that relationship back. And I know that later on, as enthusiastic as she was, it changed. It says that there's a second meeting, and this is a picture of Gary Brown. It's a fish he caught soon after his release from prison in 2010. That, for me, that would really ruin me. I mean, it would. If I saw my offender out holding up a fish that he caught in the ocean proudly, I would have a hard time with that. Because, you know, he's kind of making a hand gesture. He's really proud. And yes, he's got a second chance at life. I mean, it's just remarkable to me that this woman had it in her 
and really felt that she had that kind of forgiveness in her to give to him so he can go out and fish and do everything he wants to do. I know he did go back to, uh, he, he was incarcerated briefly again for using a cell phone in a certain type of environment he wasn't supposed to be using. And he did attempt to try to help another woman, a pregnant woman, by letting her move in with him. But then she had her own issues and it just wasn't going to work out. He had to ask her to leave. But what I wanted to emphasize here at the bottom is, you know, she had that picture taken with him. And it was all kind of, it wasn't all rainbows and unicorns, but it it was so giving and so loving and so like he was a family member. And Ms. White's family was not on board with this. Most of her family was not on board with this. Kathy's family, the deceased victim, they really weren't on board for this. They they saw it, it was just, they weren't on the same page at all. So it was just pretty much her and Kathy's daughter. But it says here that even though they did meet and text a lot, after he was released, that momentum was there. It says, other than, other than that, White and Brown's contact was largely limited to occasional updates and pleasantries. Just months after Brown's parole, White told me she was committed to playing a role in Brown's new life on the outside. She even expressed hope that they could go on a speaking tour together to counsel young people to stay out of trouble. But in the first four years after Brown's release, it didn't happen. When I checked in periodically, she'd made no moves to arrange public appearances, nor had she made the two and a half hour drive to Beaumont to see him. When I asked why, White fumbled for an explanation. Other priorities had consumed her time, she said. Finally, in early 2014, the writer says that she decided to prod her toward meeting that she that she had wanted. She asked White if she would sit down with Brown again if I came along. So. It says that she appears older than she did in the 2001 film, a little more gray, a few more wrinkles, but that same sunny face and piercing pale blue eyes. Brown, tanned and fit at 43, is dressed neatly in new, loose-fitting jeans and a shiny polyester shirt that fails to hide a prodigious number of prison tattoos, including one that prominently features the word, the MNF or word. His thick hair verges on gray and is cut conservatively. His eyes are mournful, more worried than weary. Though he can't normally afford to eat out, he knows right where to find cat, catfish chicken, kitchen, I'm sorry, catfish kitchen on a bleak commercial strip off I-10, popular with a diverse after church crowd and big on fried everything. Well, as soon as they settled into their chairs and ordered the buffet, Gary Brown took charge his opening question, so how have things been going for you in your life? Elicits from White a transparently sanitized response. Except for this, gesturing to her oxygen tank, really pretty good, but Brown won't let it go. Each time that White tries to lighten the mood with a critique of the catfish or turn the conversation to Brown's post-prison accomplishments, he wants to go toward deeper waters. He's crying. He acknowledges her forgiveness of him, but says he can't grant the same to himself. You tell me. Let go, forgive, he says to her, 
but I can't say I've done that yet. I can't. White responds in her soothing drawl. I know. We'll keep working on it, Gary. We'll keep working on it. She reaches across the table to hold his hand. Now she's in her element, the caregiver and the peacemaker, more comfortable than when Brown asked her to revisit her own pain. Well, apparently, Brown stopped responding to some messages that he just basically started the life started the law-abiding life that his victim wanted him to live now and the life that she considers payment in full for the debt he owes her. His original sentence would have run until 2040 when he is almost 70, but until then he's a parolee and the state of Texas is the final arbiter of what he owes society. So basically, If you see or know a crime victim, there is so much more to the surface than what you hear on the news at night. You're going to hear, you know, depending on where you live, just the worst of the worst. You know, say a triple homicide or, you know, a woman was abducted or any kind of headline that has to do with a, a crime. I, I want to show you how deep the wound goes. Just how deep it goes. It's painful in many ways to see him out there fishing and living his normal life. And it does tell us we are to forgive those who trespass against us. And I do believe that you can do that. I do believe you can forgive that person, but I, I also don't believe that you're ever going to get that void filled from what it does to you. You're never going to be able to fill that void. And that is the injustice of violent crime, of crime. That's the injustice and that's the brutal reality is that you're never going to be able to fill that void again. You're not going to be able to recapture that time in your life. You lose a part of yourself and you almost shed like a locust. You shed a skin, a shell. And that's just where we are as everything seems to kind of shift in our society. I, I don't really know how else to put it. Things are unraveling and I am astounded at the amount of jobless claims. It is all a recipe. You know, I saw what looked like full frontal nudity on television at nine o'clock at night on network TV. I think it, part of it was blurred out. And I really don't have any words to say about that. Other than these are really usually the final stages before something, com uh, a society completely implodes the degradation of a society. And I believe that while we still do have a justice system, especially here in Texas, it seems to me that the ideology of a crime, what a crime really is now, is moved towards people exhaling oxygen or carbon dioxide, I'm sorry. That carbon footprint, that's where, that's the new, criminal. That's the new criminal in, the, in, in our new reality. And I'm just not so sure 
with everything going on, and I see the massive amounts of certain people being released from institutions in different countries, I do believe that you must find a way to protect yourself. You must find a way to protect yourself and be aware. And if you are ill and you are suffering with an illness, staying informed is very important. And with that information, it can trigger PTSD. I've experienced that. It can trigger that, and it can trigger really an incapacitating fear. But the best way to handle that is to stay prepared and to try to have whatever it is that you're fearful of covered or have a plan to cover it. And like I've always said, you know, for your whatever it is like that you use most commonly, if you can order if you can order some things online and have them delivered to your home or your place of residence if you're incapacitated or debilitated, I think that's a really good way to do it. You know, if you have to go fill up your car, if you actually have to leave the house, say you're going to go to somebody's party or get together at night and you're on and you're below half a tank, I, I would tell you, first of all, not to go out at night. But whatever you do, try to keep in mind not to position yourself at night to have to stop at a gas station. And ladies and gentlemen, please don't pick up anybody in a situation like where they're playing the heartstrings. And a, a lot of us ladies, we feel sorry for people. And we take pity upon people and think that they couldn't actually do the things that they can do, but they can and they will. And they're out there looking to do those things. I just want you all safe. And I just want you to know that crime, it goes to the very core of your soul. And it's painful because you have lost, you, you do end up losing not just that part of yourself, but possibly another person. And I don't want that to happen to you. Okay, everybody. Well, be careful out there. Stay informed of what's going on in your neighborhood. You know, check the police blotter. You know, do a search. Find out who lives around you. And keep your head on a swivel. You're less likely to be a victim if you don't engage with people that you don't know. Don't let people get you involved in a conversation. People you don't know, don't let them engage you. Compliments can be distractions. And when you're feeling down and out, a compliment feels and sounds pretty good. But just keep on moving. Okay, everyone. Well, I'll be back soon. Thank you. God bless you all. And have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.